This is Jordan Edwards, and this is the Business Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. Hello, John. Hello. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for coming on the Business Jiu-Jitsu Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah. What do you think about this whole thing? Well, on my way here, I was listening to uh, Mark Marin interview DiCaprio and Pitt for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. So I wanted to get my uh, podcast swagger up. I figured that was probably <laughs> the best one to oh. uh, to listen to for my first podcast is that, is that of such 2020. A good movie? How good is that movie? It's uh, it was an amazing movie, and uh, I was very happy to see uh, more DiCaprio nominated for best actor because uh, Pitt already won Globe. Yeah, and he was amazing. Amazing. But DiCaprio was also amazing. Yeah, and Pitt had a great speech saying that. Anyone that's in a movie with DiCaprio winds up up here winning an award. And really, the only reason we're winning an award is because we're doing this with DiCaprio. And yeah. he makes everybody better. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, it, it's, it's very true. Every movie that guy makes is just incredible. Well, and with Tarantino, too. Yeah. They've, done, they've all done a bunch of stuff together. Uh, Pitt did uh, True Romance with Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Uh, little Role. He was basically passed out on the couch the whole time. Yeah. He did Inglorious Bastards. Oh, how good was that one? Very, uh, very good flick. Yeah, the and Cap- Leo got to torch some Nazis in this movie, too. That's right. <laughs> um, Tarantino happens to be married to a Jew. Really? So, yes. So, there may be some underlying uh, <laughs> uh, forces there. I like that. But, uh, but DiCaprio did his film in Django, where he was probably Tarantino's most, most ruthless character he's ever made in any of his yeah. his films. Yeah, he, he was very, very good in that movie also. I actually took a class on Quentin Tarantino films when I was in college. Syracuse. Well, actually, I was on academic probation this semester. <laughs> so uh, I was at... Uh, <laughs> I was at Onondaga Community College, OCC. <laughs> I uh, decided to uh, take some credits up at Syracuse. All right. Yeah. So let's uh, let's uh, now let's pause for a second. I mean, uh, we're getting into your history, which is you know one of the reasons why we're here. Um, let me give the people a little background on you. First and foremost, you're one of my best friends in the world. I've known you since uh, I'm seven years old. You were six years old. We grew up, went to camp together, playing sports. Uh, our, our friendship reemerged after college. You're an incredibly successful businessman, investor. Uh, you're also a trustee of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel. Uh, had the opportunity to go a few weeks ago to watch you being honored in front of 500 of the most influential people in New York at the Pierre Hotel. Uh, I was it, it, proud would be an understatement. Uh, you were married this past year. You have a baby on the way. And, you know, one of the reasons I asked you to be on this business jujitsu podcast, even though you don't practice jujitsu, is because the principles of business and jujitsu are so deeply connected. And one of my core values in my business is that people do business with people and people do business with people that they like. And of all of my friends and a lot of people that I know, uh, what you do uh, in the insurance business and selling is all about relationships and treating people well and developing these re- relationships is at the core of it. So just riff a little, talk to me about, you know, growing up, talk to me about what it was like watching your mom in business, going to college, not having a straight path and still finding success. Yeah. So, um, I actually, uh, you call it business jujitsu yeah. in what I do, uh, I like to refer uh, or analogize, analogize, and make analogies I about what I do. Yeah. Um, more, more towards baseball. Okay. But uh, I know that you're a big uh, jujitsu guy, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll tie it all together. We'll, we'll grapple. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So, uh, fairly, uh, you know, average student, uh, very active in you know sports, uh, social life. Um, went to uh, Syracuse, uh, where I got a degree in psychology. Uh, as you previously heard, I, you know, a couple bumps along the way, uh, academic probation, and um, you know, a couple of times it was uh, 
you know, I, it took me uh, a couple of years to finish school. <laughs> not a straight path. Definitely not a straight path. Um, and as you know, as you mentioned before, we, uh, you know, we grew up together, going to camp together. We really uh, reconnected after um, after college. And I have to say, I, I didn't expect to be doing this. You know, if we if we had headphones on our ears, I definitely yeah. thought that we'd be like DJing for like <laughs> thousands of people at like you know some kind of music festival. Yeah, you and know? we've been to quite. I, a I, I feel festivals. like. I feel like hearing my 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 voice in my ears right now. I feel like DJ like Liquid Todd or something <laughs> on like BPM. Yeah, yeah. It is funny to think back ten years or eleven years ago and uh, all the music festivals and travels we'd done. But now uh, I'm a father. Yep. You're about to be a father in a couple months. Yeah, and it's uh, very exciting. I wouldn't have had it any other way. But yeah, it is ironic <laughs> that we have these headphones it's on. Very exciting. I mean, we went to Bonnaroo. Yeah. Many years in a row, oh, and now I look at the lineup, and I can't, I re- can't recognize anybody, any, <laughs> any act. I'm like, what? am I really this removed? It's only been like two, three years, yeah. but you know, uh, pulled that ripcord and got out. Yeah, well, yeah. We had some good, some good times at Bonnaroo too. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah, go back to college. I think it's important for people to hear that you can have great success even though you stumble along the way. Yeah. So. Um, what I could say about my time at college was, um, you know, going from high school to college was a very difficult transition. Personally, uh, I, I was not mature enough to go to college at 18. It was very popular in high school. Um, and, wh- you know, from where I'm from, which is from Long Island, um, and most places you graduate high school when you're a senior, you know, all things, you know, if you're still on the straight <laughs> path, you know, by that point, um, and you go to college. I don't think that I personally was mature enough to be sent to a, you know, a school like Syracuse knowing like what that costs and um, just the responsibilities as a student that go with that, mm-hmm. but it's the next step. Yeah. Um, I think that when you, uh, conversely, when you look at, you know, a country like Israel Mm -hmm. that sends their uh, 18-year-olds, boys for three years, girls for two years to the military. Mm -hmm. Uh, It allows, while it's very, very difficult, um, that's the natural progression there. But it allows the 18-year-old mind to really develop Mm -hmm. and uh, have responsibility, build confidence, um, be creative. there, there's a lot of creative thinking that has to take place. You're 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 pushed to the limits mentally and physically yeah. um, for three years, and and by the time you get out, you you know you decide uh, I want to go to university, or you've had three years to think about what you want to do with your life after. Mm-hmm. Go to study, go to travel, come back. You're just thinking of you know you're you're just thinking about things more globally. Yeah. So, and many people who finish the military in Israel, they travel after, even before they start college. They take six months, a year, two years, and they travel the world. That's right. And I think that that's why in, out of such a small country, you see such a, you know, such a entrepreneurial spirit that's kind of emerging there. Yeah. Um, I mean, Great book on that called Startup Nation. Startup Nation, of course. And just the amount of, you know, VCs that enter that, uh, enter that, that environment and, on a you know pro rata basis, how what the success rate is on Israeli you know startups specifically in like the high tech space is yeah. really incredible. Yeah, but um, probably the most successful country per capita of any country in the world. And I believe that um, I believe that those three years are critical to um, to an, to a young person's you know growth and development. So anyway, uh, back to me. So I go to college at that time. I was not mature enough. I, I didn't succeed. I was partying. I was, uh, I wasn't as popular as I was in you know. I was like a in, in high school. I was like a small fish in a really big pond. And, yeah. Uh, I was used to things coming like very easy for me. And uh, you know, you go into you know central New York. It's cold. You don't want to go outside. You're living with a bunch of friends, smoking a lot of pot, yeah. drinking, girls, like all the good stuff that. You know, you want out of school, but if you don't, if you don't have discipline, 
uh, you're not feeling the consequences of what happens when you're not performing, then you know you it goes face, off the you, rails real it fast. Goes off the, it goes off the rails. Those semesters are short. It only takes you know a couple of bad grades to to really blow it, and I blew it a couple times. Um, the worst part is they ask you to, to what do you want to major in? Well, you know. I don't know. Uh, let me see here. Look, what, is, what, what do you have in the book? Uh, and I, I picked psychology because I was in like this uh, arts and sciences school. I mean, yeah. you know, it was interesting. I, I find it useful. It's but that's not you know. I just wasn't prepared for for to make to answer that question. Right. And uh, and that was that. Man. So after school. Um, I actually decided to go to Israel to do a military course for a couple of months. Uh, it's basic training um, for foreigners that are thinking about m moving to Israel, making Aliyah. Yep. And uh, obviously the military is a big part of the culture there. So um, so they allow these foreign you know, teens, tweens, whatever we call them, yeah. uh, to, to do an optional military service and continue with it. I it was during the first Lebanon, the second Lebanon war, uh, which is really why I wanted to go into the yeah. army. By the time I was done with that three and a half month training, uh, the war was over and I, uh, yeah, came, I mean, I, I remember I came back to one. use my, uh, psychology education <laughs> that I got from Syracuse. Yeah. I mean, I remember seeing you at those times and it was, you know, I w I'm not going to go as far as to say it was scandalous, but like it was something that you, you made this very conscious t choice to do something, uh, out of the norm for our group of friends. And, uh, there's could be no doubt that that was one of the pivotal and transformative moments of your life where, uh, it set you up for so much success, uh, down the road. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was a wild time. I remember uh, just coming home the night before I was flying out, and just like took a buzzer out and shaved my head. It was very <laughs> like dramatic. Yeah, uh, never done that. Like never had like that short a haircut before. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a wild time. You know, I'm living in a tent. There's a war like 50 miles away. Yeah, I'm ready to ready to. I get it on. Yeah. Um, you know, luckily, uh, you know, that was taken care of before. So uh, you, you have this transformative experience. You come back. You start working. You join a family business. Uh, and, you know, that's not always so easy. People think, oh, when you have a family business to walk into, it's, it's, it's just granted that it's going to be uh, – that it's going to be simple or a cakewalk. But, uh, you know, you and I both come from a family business background, and it can be incredibly challenging. Talk about that a little. Yeah, so I, I I joined a family business. I joined my stepfather's business. Yeah. Uh, at that time, it was called Sterling and Sterling, and uh, you know it it wasn't you know uh, he's always been extremely gracious. Uh, I, I've never walked around that building or or our office like it was my company. He it, he made it clear that. Uh, and he's got other family members in the business. There's no nepotism. You earn what, you know, if you earn and you work hard, then you'll, you know, he, he can't give me the respect. He can't make people respect me or be nice to me or be polite to me. Yeah. Uh, you need to go out and perform every night. It's like, it's like LeBron. Yeah. If LeBron goes out and he puts a stinker up, they don't care that, you know, he's – the best basketball player that we've seen in, in our generation. You know, you got to perform to get the love. And it's the same thing uh, when you walk into into our office. So let me set that up for you. If we didn't mention it, you work in the insurance business. And the insurance business is about forming relationships with other business owners and taking care of their insurance needs. Every single business needs insurance. And how do those businesses decide who they're going to work with? It's all about the relationship. It's all about relationship. Um, it is and it isn't, you know. Um, it, it depends, you know, it depends what the sale is. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to you wanna walk in. You, look, obviously, somewhat, people like doing business with people they like. Um, if, but um, 
you know, people love calling insurance a commodity. Right. It, it, I used to call insurance a commodity. I used to say what I do is a commodity. You can go out and find the cheapest price and, um, you know, that that's what it is. But that's really not what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, people with uh, with not a lot of experience in business and people with not a lot of exposure to uh, risk or hazards, they'll say that. Yeah. And, 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 and they're wrong. Right. People that, um, you know, you're in the real estate business. You know that, um, you know things happen. Things, yeah. ha- you know, things happen that are out of out of your control. You know, an older building, a pipe can pop in the night. On a really cold night, the pipes can freeze. They're going to freeze. Some, <laughs> there's always, you know, that one day of the year, February 11th, yeah. t- 2008, where you know that like you're seeing losses on everybody's. The, you know, you're like, oh, you gotta just, you know, you, you know what that claim was. Because yeah. there's always that coldest day of the year that, you know, you see all the real estate guys have frozen <laughs> pipes. Well, you know, I'm in the real estate business. My two primary disciplines, real estate and fashion, uh, things go wrong. Employees, they you have the best intentions for employees, for tenants, for vendors, for service providers. But the simple fact is, is that things go wrong and you must be insured properly in order to cover yourself. And, that, and that's where, like, the rubber meets the road, and it's not just a commodity. People will not have the right coverage, and uh, they're, the claim's going to be excluded, and it's costing you, you know, you, you want to, you know, it's really like pennywise dollar foolish. Yeah. Is that? Pennywise pound foolish. Yeah, so that's what that is, you know? Um, and so that's where I come in, uh, and I'd like to think that I do things differently. I'm a relationship guy for sure. Yeah. Um, but. Um, so let, let's stop I've there. Become... Let's stop there for a second. You're a relationship guy. This is the Business Jiu-Jitsu Podcast, right? What what does this have to do with the the, the tied principles between business and jiu-jitsu? Um, my first podcast last week was all about my, my most important principle in business, which is just starting. When I had the idea to do this, within a week, I formulated the idea, booked this podcast, called you and a few other guests that I wanted to have on the show, and I didn't waste any single time. I did. I took my own advice, which was from my first book, which is just start. There's nothing else in business that matters before you start. You could have the best idea. You could be the most prepared. You could do the most research. But if you never start, you don't get anywhere. And the, the one of the th- reasons why I thought of you, outside of I think that you're a, a great guest and this is a, a, an amazing format for you personally, when, when people do business with people that they like, they're people you want to give the business to because you trust them and you like them. And you have a, a certain way with people. Some people that you just meet, people that you do business with and are friends. Even as we were sitting in the lobby getting ready for this podcast, you struck up a conversation with one of the guys that were doing a podcast. Most people are not going to just strike up a conversation. You had no vested interest. This wasn't about business, but you just started engaging this guy. And I could think of whether we were in a, a farm in Tennessee at a music festival, skiing in Aspen, sitting on the beach in Greece, uh, traveling all over the world. It does, and, and people say this about my dad too. Whether it's a taxi driver, uh, a, a club owner, a waiter, you are the same John. Everybody gets the same John. And you seem to be just as interested in engaging with people whether they have something to offer you or not. And I think that that creates a magnetic personality that should be admired by many people. So back to jujitsu, when you step on that mat for the first time and you just start, you need to be a good training partner for people. And in business, you need to be somebody that people want to do business with. And so often I, I encounter people that are, that are just assholes and they don't even recognize it. But you have a way with people that should be admired, and that's one of the primary reasons I wanted to You're bring you in today. You're very kind. You're kind. Uh, look, business is tough. You know, uh, I was saying before, it's like baseball, right? Yeah. You're going to get up at bat, and if you fail, you know, 75% of the time, you, you might be an all-star that year. You know, yeah. if you're batting 250, and, you know, the, the, the couple of hits that you did get, yeah. Are you know homers or triple you know and you're doing you could you could be great yeah that, I think that's very much you know I don't think that's exclusive to insurance and I don't think that's exclusive to being a, a broker of any kind uh, I think that is just basic principles um, you know they say winning breeds winning well mm-hmm. I I think 
failure breeds winning mm, because you need at bats, you need to uh, know what lo- you need to learn from your losses so you don't do them again. But if you're only winning, you, you're not. You know, they say like uh, it, when you're in, un- in an uncomfortable space is when you're you're growing the most. Yes, and who likes to lose? You know, so you got to learn from those experiences so that you can grow from them and not make that same mistake again and keep keep at it. Yeah. So talk to, talk to the beginner you, you know, the you who's now just coming out of the Israeli army and you're starting your career and, or to the person that's just starting jujitsu and they're a fresh beginner and they're just getting their butt kicked. You you, you are out there. You know, you are going to events every single week. You're supporting dozens of charity events. Your networking skills are top notch. So talk to that person, the person that you were now 11, 12 years later uh, having a career. You got to be out there, you know. You have to be out there. So in any sales role and, you know, back from when I was in high school, I was selling knives. I was selling Cutco knives, you know, <laughs> one summer. Uh, I think I was, like, the top knife salesman, like, on Long Island. They wanted me to, like, talk to, like, a whole, like, like two, 300 people on Long Island. I was, like, 17 years old, smoking pot, like, with all the money I was uh, <laughs> making from knives. Yeah. And, uh, and so... Um, but uh, one like really important thing I learned from that, or or what they what they taught us like, from back then was is sit down, write down all your friends, all your family, and start with, you know, that as your sales platform. But entering into a family business, as you mentioned before, most of my friends and family were either working with us in one way or another, or you know working with other people in my company that just wanted to work with the company and I wasn't there yet. So, yeah. you know, I've got my uncle doing business with the guy sitting next to me, you know. <laughs> I, you know, it was very uh, it was a very difficult situation that I uh, walked into, mind you, uh 2008. Uh was like <laughs> global financial right, meltdown right there. Um and with you know, getting to those relationships, you know, for me, the 23-year-old guy I gotta break relationships. Yeah, you know my my guys aren't the decision makers at this time. Right. I've got to walk into a whole different peer group, guys that are really like in their forties and fifties, and uh, and who are the decision makers. And I'm meeting with uh, CFOs. CFOs are typically who makes the decisions in what I do. And right. you know, uh, I was like a little shit. <laughs> so it was you know, it was it, what it made me do was pick different industries that I was in, interested in, yeah. like um, parking, hmm. okay. parking industry. I'm like going to meetings. It, parking, the parking industry is why I didn't drive here today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, parked, I parked the other day. Yeah. I parked somewhere for 61 minutes. Okay. It cost me $60. All right, we're in New York City. <laughs> Parking is a is but if a, I but if I luxurious but if I premium if I had just here. gotten there two minutes before yeah. it would have been like twenty five dollars. There's like a premium into the next hour. So anyway, so I take the subway here today, and I'm going to take the subway home. Very but, nice. Uh, uh, and I, uh, I saw that they do subway creatures here. Is another podcast. Yeah, I saw a guy that was tatted up like beyond anything I've ever seen before, <laughs> ever like just like. They weren't even tattoos. They you just colored in his body. <laughs> it was really weird. Anyway, I thought the parking in the street because you could charge sixty dollars in and out. They've got hundreds of cars doing. I'm like, whoever owns these garages is just making a ton of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just started cold calling them, and that was like my first like class of business I really focused on was the parking industry, and I did really well. Um, I was you know insuring I'd say seventy five percent of the uh, garages in you know lower Manhattan yeah um, and that was my first you know class of business that I really attacked and uh, obviously you know uh, real estate real estate development mm-hmm. that that's you know that's really what gets my blood you know going I love it mm-hmm. um, I love to participate in it from an investment standpoint my family has uh, you know 
generational real estate. We've yeah. owned, developed, managed. Um, Your mom's a very talented real estate developer, someone truly to admire. She is. Um, and so that's, you know, so that's really what I spend most of my time doing is working with um, real estate developers and owners and uh, management companies and lenders, uh, you know, ironing out insurance requirements, fighting for the clients, things like that. Yeah. So, um, but that's all relationship based. Once you knock somebody, once you're able to knock somebody out, um, you know, and you become like their trusted uh, advisor, and you know you're doing the right thing for them. You're not being short sighted. Yeah. Um, that they'll keep, you know, it'll keep coming, and they'll tell their friends. Yeah. And that's the best. The best is referrals, and this guy did a great job for me, and um, and it's you know just in the last couple of years, it's it's gotten. It, it does start to get easier once you build momentum. That's that's one of the critical things to to let people know. I can go to my office and sit at my desk, and I will now be getting the calls. Can mm -hmm. you help me? Can you help a friend? Can you do this? Uh, I, but I also love going out at, you know, I'm working nine to five, nine to yeah. six, eight to, you know, I'm putting those 10, 12 hours in it. And that's just working on the stuff that I'm, I'm creating for myself uh, after hours, right. after hours where you're really generating, you know, the opportunities and the momentum. Um, so, yeah. you know, you, as I mentioned before, you, you recently became a trustee of Yad Vashem, which I want to dig into in a second, but uh, for the dozen or so preceding years before you became highly engaged in this organization, you, you were engaged in, in other capacities with other charitable organizations, but you're out constantly, whether it's client dinners, new dinners, um, supporting other charity events that you're not a part of. How important is this in, in not only doing the right thing, but in generating business? Look, uh, I, I do a lot of stuff on my own, but um, you, you want to you wanna support the people that are supporting you. So when I know that my friends and my colleagues and my associates are showing up for my stuff, I want to reciprocate. And, um, and you learn and you meet and, and you know, you, and you schmooze. You know, I like I could talk to a doorknob. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I'm interested in talking to the doorknob. If I'm yeah. not, then I just don't want to talk. Well. Um, but... Yeah, so uh, a, a lot of what I do is uh, going out and you know putting the you know putting the time in, um, pushing. Uh, sometimes you just want to get home. Um, it's especially become harder now that you know I'm married and I just want to get home to my wife. But yeah, um, yeah. So and uh, you know I used to work out after hours. Now uh, you know there's not enough time. You gotta work out in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta. It's hard to manage everything, but you gotta uh, prioritize what you know what you need to fit into your day, um, and what what's gonna lead to successful business transactions, successful relationship. You know, meaningful. You know, meaningful collateral and relationships. Um, so you know, it's just part of the part of life. That's yeah. you know. I don't know what you know they're doing in you know Oshkosh, you know, <laughs> Wisconsin. I think right. it's in or Milwaukee, but yeah. you know in New York, I mean, there, there's just a lot of there's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. Uh, it could be distracting. You gotta kind of hide from some of the stuff. Yeah, I mean, listen, especially as you get older, uh, some of the fun things you do when you're coming up is when you get right out of college, you have to consciously eliminate those things a little bit, little by little. Uh, it's very tempting to want to go out all the time. There's a balance in everything in life. You definitely got to pick your spots. Uh, you know, we, you know, we, as, as you mentioned earlier, we were honored at a dinner a couple of weeks ago. Um, another organization asked us to uh, participate in a, a gala function that they were doing, and I said, "You could use my name. You can mm -hmm. use our name, but um, and I'll show up. But yeah. I can't be part of like your planning team. Like I gotta." I gotta do, you know, I gotta work, right. and I gotta do some other stuff. So, you, look, there's a balance because they will, uh, 
they will come after you. You yeah, know, that's... once one organization <laughs> knows that you're a giver, yeah. they're all coming. Very true. They're all coming. Well, I was talking to uh, a dear friend of mine about this this week. Uh, one of my main contractors in my business, him and I do, uh, we have at least two projects at all times going on, whether he's building out my retail stores or doing work in my properties. He's, um, he's Dominican and he's incredibly charitable. He has a relationship with the Marvel organization and he's uh, donating toys to orphans in the Dominican Republic. He's building homes uh, and it's like the guy can't, seem to squeeze out enough time to, to do his job and also do all the charity work that he's so passionate about. And I love to support his charity work. On Thanksgiving, he's coming to me to try to donate 20 turkeys to the needy. Um, on Christmas, he's coming to me about uh, getting toys for the orphans. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, it's incredibly admirable that you love to do these things. But if you don't have time for yourself or if this is taking away from your job, you're not going to be able to help these people. you got to be careful. You can't give... You can't give above your weight class. Yeah, if you're very well if said. you're giving above, getting back to the jujitsu, yeah. is there weight classes in yeah, that, or absolutely. does it go by belt uh, belt color? Belt and weight. Okay, so you can't you know you can't be given like a black belt uh, at 150 pounds when you know you should be giving you know like a, like a purple belt. Is that a good belt? Yes, purple okay. belts are very high. well like a white belt. Yeah, you know you gotta know what you can do. Uh, that, and do that because if you, someone's going to be having to give you some charity if if you're uh, constantly punching outside that weight class. That is uh, very sage advice. It's perfectly suited. It's a great analogy. And in jujitsu, when you when you show up day in and day out, uh, if you aren't training the right way, you are going to burn out. And one of the things my sensei Nardu says all the time is that uh, there's a there's a rumor that practice makes perfect. But if you practice incorrectly, you will have an incorrect practice. So what he says is that perfect practice makes perfect. And showing up is important. Starting is important. But making sure that you have little improvements every single day and doing it the right way is truly the most important thing. Showing up, showing up on time, uh, two things that, um, two things that, you know, whether you're great or you're starting out, those are two things that you can control showing yes. up and being there on time not wasting other people's time that is something that uh whether who knows what happens when you get to the meeting or when you get to the jujitsu or if it's in a competition or who knows what happens then who knows if the other guy from the other side of the table is in a bad mood or what he's got going on in his life if he yeah. wants to meet with you if he's meeting with you because someone asked him to meet with you who knows but uh those are two things that some of those things are out of your control, showing up. I call those fundamentals. Those are fundamental ABCs in life, business, and jiu-jitsu or any sport. And that's really the theme of today's podcast, which is focusing on those fund fundamentals that make you successful. We were in Miami over the holiday. We had dinner with friends, and, you know, it's not our town. And uh, we, we left what I thought was like a, a good amount of time before dinner, 30 minutes. And it's reading that we're showing up at dinner 15 minutes late. And this is just for a social thing. Yeah. And I'm freaking out. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't like being late for, the, you know, when, when you're supposed to be, you know, it's when you're supposed to be somewhere, you got to be somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you're very punctual. I uh, like to, I like to fill it all in because yeah. uh, what if, you know, what if you have to go home and, and it's not, you don't want to go home yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you miss some minutes on the front. <laughs> very, very true. Yeah. Yeah. So what uh, what kind of things are you working on now? You have any big deals cooking? You don't have to get into the details, but anything you're excited about? Um, we're, you know, my, my insurance business is, my insurance business is going really well. Uh, working with a lot of great, uh, prolific developers who are working deals in, you know, New York, putting up, you know, residential. I've got hotel deals. I've got office deals, New York, Miami, uh, looking at things all over the place. So um, business is great. And we're looking at, you know, along with my brother uh, and our partner, Jeremy, we're looking at, you know, some interesting real estate deals. Um, New York, I can't, I can't understand New York real estate right now. <laughs> it's really scary. Yeah. Um, People are sending me deals all day. Um, I, I, I just kind of stopped looking at them. Mm -hmm. um, if they, you know, I don't just want the deck. I yeah. want you to get on the phone and walk me through it. Yeah. Because I'm not gonna, 
uh, not going to try and you know understand it on my own. I sure. need I need to hear the pitch. Yeah, a deck uh, is like a PowerPoint presentation for those who don't know. And financials, the yeah. what the what the concept of the deal is, where you know where the deal is going to be in five years, two years, whatever yeah. it is, what yeah. the what the outs are, what the risk is. Um, so it's you know th- there's a lot going on. Um, you just got to pick your spots. There's there's plenty of deals to do. Plenty of deals. It's just are there plenty of good deals, and that's you know that it takes a lot of will to uh, to, to make a good deal. Well, you know, getting back to that baseball analogy, if, yeah. you know, it, it's probably less than, you know, one out of four deals. It's probably like one out of 50 deals is, is the right deal for you. Right. Um, and you got to look at 50 deals to find the one. Yeah. So, absolutely true. You know, these are all, you know, all these fundamentals and foundations we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, they're, they're just themes that keep coming up. Absolutely. No one bats a thousand. So let's talk about podcasting for a minute. Let's switch gears away from the business. What do you think about this format we're doing? Is this fun? I think I I like it. I think this is like a good fit. We should do this all the time. I would do it. I've, I've been listening to radio for years. Yeah. Not podcast, but talk radio. I listened to the Michael K show yeah. uh, with Don LaGreca and Peter Rosenberg. Peter Rosenberg joined their show like four or five years ago. He's the... He's one of the guys on the Hot 97 mm-hmm. uh, morning drive. Yeah. And so he goes from, like, the hip-hop channel to, like, the sports station. Yeah. and But he's amazing. And he, t- like, brings the show together. It's, you know, it's, like, sports, but it's, like, talk. Yeah. And uh, I think that the, thir- the three-person dynamic, so it was always Michael and Don, and they were always great. Michael is the voice of the Yankees. Don does the Yankees, uh, does the Ra- New York Rangers show. Yeah. Um, and they brought Peter on, and he brings like the pop culture, but he's also really great at sports. Yeah. and it's just like it's it's great. Listen, I I did uh, ten podcasts in promoting of the book that I wrote last year, and it every time I went on as a guest on people's podcast, I walked out and I just felt like a million bucks. I said, "Wow, this is such a great format. Not only is it great to go promote my business and my book, but I just like doing it." I liked talking into the mic. I, I, I thought that it was uh, interesting. You meet people. It also gives you the opportunity to invite people on your show and talk to them about things that interest you. And uh, I, I think that like there's something here for even our group of friends and like our extended group of friends to network and and explore. You know, as we get older, think about it this way: every weekend, post college, you knew you were going to see a hundred of your friends. Friday night, I didn't even have to think about it. I knew I was going out, and I knew I was going to be seeing, you know, these concentric circles of either college friends or home friends or people that I grew up with and their friends. And as the years went on, you stop start going out less. People start pairing off and having kids. They get more serious in their careers. They move. Uh, some of our best friends moved. Our friend Brad moved to Los Angeles. Our friend Gavin moved to Miami. Uh, my our dear friend Chris moved to Dubai, who uh, was my roommate in boarding school that John has become great friends with. Uh, and then a lot of our best friends are moving out of the city. And so the nature of these relationships change. And I think that podcasting is a great format to get together and set a time during the week where you can get together and talk about life and business and, and all these things. I agree. I think we'll really know who likes us by finding out who listens to this. Yeah. Well, as you know in business, you can't always rely on your friends. But it's good. you know, I kind of want to know like what's what's our friend Steven up to? You know? You know um, he'd be a great guest on this there's, thing. There's there's uh there's that saying uh if I give all my friends discounts and my enemies won't buy from me. Who am I going to make money off of? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. So, I haven't heard uh, of that. yeah. So, uh, yeah. I could think of a handful of friends. Uh, we got to get Aaron Daniels in here. We got to get uh, Scott Lorberbaum in here. We got to get Gavin Crescenzo. I think that it's. I think a we might have to take two hours for Gavin. <laughs> that's. He is one of the or most we have to have, alive. Or we have to have like a button to like turn his mic off for like you know, so we can get a few words in. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great format to share. Uh, listen, there's a – social media is highly edited. Can't get into it today, but John knows that I ha- I don't I don't love Instagram. It's this highly edited version of your life, a, a, a snapshot. 
But when you're podcasting and you're flowing for an hour, you can't help but be the most real version of yourself. We need to have another episode about that, yeah. about this social media. Um, and it, it's, you know, when we were sitting here in the waiting room, yeah. I wasn't trying to have too much chit chat with you <laughs> because I wanted it to be authentic when we came in here. I didn't yeah. want to talk about like, or rehearse the things that we were going to say because it wouldn't be authentic that way. Yeah. So, you know, Instagram and that post yeah. is the least authentic thing yeah. that is put into the universe that influences people. And I, I, I have an issue. Yeah. And it's a train wreck. Yeah. And I can't I stop agree. watching. <laughs> and I'm guilty. Yeah. But it's, it, you know, these, these, you know, fitness chicks become pregnant and have kids and now they're not fitness chicks anymore now they're mom experts and it's like <laughs> fuck it's <tough>. you <laughs> it's tough fuck it's... you you've been a mom for like six weeks <laughs> yeah it's it is it's very very difficult to you, listen we're the test generation we were the first generation with computers and social media. I mean, I remember signing up for my first AOL account in 1996. I remember getting D, uh, CD-ROMs in the mail that gave me 10 free hours on my <laughs> dial-up. Yeah, exactly. Okay? I was in, in, I was in 11th grade when I had my first high-speed modem. Yeah. I think, do you know what a Xennial is? No. A Xennial is a micro-generation. So I don't really feel like I fit in in the millennial category. Well, I don't here know at if the top. you do. I, I feel, I, some things, you know, I, I do definitely feel millennially in some things, and then sometimes I have no way to relate to the people. But you're born in 1984. I'm born in 1985. You're the exact same age as Mark Zuckerberg. We were the first Facebook class, you know, 2004. So we are, we're the top of the generation of the millennials. Zennial, here, this is what it says. Zennials yeah. are, are the micro generation of people on the cusp of Gen X and millennial demographic typically born in the late 70s to early 80s. Xennials are described as having had analog childhood and a digital adulthood. Right. That's exactly That's what I just said. That's exactly what you said. You know. And it's it's a really interesting uh your brother to solve. your brother yeah. is a full-blown millennial. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. I had a Nokia analog phone. Yep. I had a beeper. <laughs> I bet you did. I had a beeper. <laughs> You know, uh, that's one of the ways you fell off the straight and narrow in high school, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I got all those one four threes. <laughs> but yeah. um, no, but you know, I I do just to get back to it. I think that this podcasting is an incredibly authentic way and a new way to engage in deep and meaningful conversation. Which that's like always one of our favorite things to do. I mean, I can't even count the amount of nights that we've seen the sunrise. What doing time this. is this place open until? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or what time does it open? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what I, time does it open? Is it open at like five? I don't know, but I am positive that you and I could sit here until the sun if, comes if up it and then some. If it opened until I, if it opened at like three, it would be great. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, listen, we're definitely going to do this again. It's fun. Uh, the next one, we should maybe talk about this in more detail. Um, but there is just some, some like, amazing moments i think about matt lorberbaum's bachelor party last day sun coming up having these this conversation with brad in a hot tub and we just have had these incredible conversations that have happened and they were just for us but i think that there's not necessarily that that, that people care but i think that there's a lot to be learned from them and memorializing them in this fashion is uh if Instagram is inauthentic, I think that this is the most true uh, medium that we could present, both in the video and also well, spoken I word. Well, I mean, look, I can't say, like, for sure for, like, when this podcast blows up and, like, yeah. thousands of people are listening to us, how authentic we'll be then. But uh, while yeah. I know that there's probably only going to be three or four people who are listening to this, <laughs> I'm good with uh, spilling yeah. the beans. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That was the thing that I said. You know, I'd always thought about podcasting. Well, first, I always loved Howard Stern. And the thing that made him so successful is just how real and candid he was, whether he was talking about his his, his penis, whether he was talking about his parents, whether he was talking about his, his marriage. Howard's the best. He's the best. Yeah. 
Um, but this won't be successful if it's not the most authentic version of yourself. It's impossible for it to be successful. Everything that I've ever done in business, when I haven't done it with my full heart, it was a flop. Well, Everything I've ever done where I put my heart and soul into it, it was with tremendous success. People are smart enough now to be able to sniff out a uh, faker. Yeah, um, for sure. We're just exposed. We're so overexposed to every medium to hear something or or to see something yeah. um, that people can choose. And if they don't like what they're hearing, they're going to change yeah. the channel. Tune out real fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, you know, when I listen to these Joe Rogan podcasts and they're two hours long, I'm like, wow, this guy got me for two hours. Yeah. And he's not only and exclusively bringing on um, – like celebrities or presidential candidates, he's bringing on scientists, he's bringing on businessmen, he's bringing on actors. It's such a wide variety, and it, I, I love it, that format. It's, it's a well-rounded, you know, he's got a well-rounded, you know, audience that wants to hear the different, you know, not, not you know, you don't have a political show. No one wants to have a political show. Yeah. Um, you know, he's uh, he's got, he does a really good job. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, pleasure. It's over? It's over. It's, uh, it's 5.50. Wow. Went fast, right? You're good. You're good, too. Oh, yeah, thanks. I, it, was, it was that whole uh, Pitt DiCaprio uh, <laughs> session I was listening to before I got here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we're definitely going to do this again. Um, I, John is going to be my uh, featured guest and co-host when he's available. Uh, I'm going to be doing this regularly. Um, I hope that he could be a part of not only – uh, one-on-one -on -one interviews where he's the subject, but I hope that in the next one he could be my co-host where we get to interview somebody together and learn more about uh, influential business people in New York. Uh, I'm, I have some UFC athletes in the, in the pipeline and some very influential peoples in, in the jiu-jitsu and the business world. And uh, everything that we talked about is analogous to each other. Um, and if you... If you listen to the most successful people in the world, that's what's going to help you get successful. Well, thank you for having me. I look forward to uh, those co-host opportunities. Yeah. I think this was a lot of fun. Great.